everyone. Welcome to this episode of Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan, and I am joined by the Arlington Commission for Arts and Cultures, Cecily Miller. Hi. As I periodically am. Hi, Cecily. And nobody fills our desk like Cecily <laughs> Miller, I can tell you. Uh, in this case, we are going to be talking about the Climate Futures project um, and we have Rachel Oliveri who is our school sustainability coordinator and three excellent interns so they ha so they tell me we'll find out for <laughs> ourselves she is uh, Clara Schneider and she is Juliette Bennett and at the end of the table Greta Mastro thanks all of you guys for being here we really appreciate it so please let's start mm -hmm. Give us a description of what it is that we're here to talk about and kind of celebrate, I would say, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this represents a year and a half of work. Um, this is a public art project called Climate Futures, and it was actually designed by an artist named Tom Starr, who couldn't be with us today, but it's a regional project. He's doing it with a few other cities and towns and also with Mass Audubon and Trustees of Reservations. His concept was to create markers that are modeled on historic markers, historic trail markers, mm -hmm. but they commemorate events that are still in our future, imagined events still in our future, uh, that have to do with the impact of climate change on the landscape, on plants and animals, and on human beings. And so here in Arlington, uh, we did the first youth-led version um, you know that at the Arts Commission, we love to work collaboratively. Mm -hmm. And so I approached Rachel Oliveri, my wonderful partner <laughs> in many things, um, and, and asked her what she thought about trying to um, implement Tom's vision in Arlington with young people, since she has, works with young people of all ages who care passionately about the environment. And she stepped up to the challenge. And uh, I should say that the Arlington Planning Department was also one of our partners because they are actively planning for right. how do we protect the town and its residents from climate change. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so we started uh, in the spring of 2021 recruiting young people and we are delighted to have three of them here today. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Rachel, I mean, first of all, so what did you think when Cecily proposed this or asked you about it? And then how did it go once you started, you know, you decided to dive in and you got to find some people to work with, right? So how did that go? Yeah, no, I, I was so excited that Cecily um, contacted me and wanted to bring me on to this. Um, I, as Cecily said, we've really collaborated on other projects together and mm -hmm. really enjoyed that collaboration. And I'm always looking for opportunities for students to get involved in projects, um, especially bringing their um, passion for environmental protection to the town. And um, so this was just, I thought, a wonderful opportunity to share with students in the schools. Um, and so, yeah, it's been a, an amazing experience, especially getting to know these students. Um, these are three of the 12. It was a highly competitive um, process um, that we, uh, you know, sent out communications about this internship opportunity. Many, many students applied and we, um, you know, narrowed it down to 12 excellent candidates. So um, it's been That's uh, really cool. Project. First of all, that many, many students applied for yes. that kind of thing. I think that that's great. And, um, you know, I'm sure, no offense to the other nine, I promise, but we clearly have the three best <laughs> ones here, right? No, just kidding. Sorry, Cecily. I, well, I was going to say that our original plan was to have eight interns, and we got such marvelous applications that we raised money in part from Sustainable Arlington. The folks at Sustainable Arlington really pitched in, and mm -hmm. we were able to fund four more stipends because this was a stipended um, internship. Great. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was a summer job. It started as a summer job. Um, yeah. And it's it's taken longer than we all expected. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. Well, let's 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 hear from you guys. Um, obviously, you were, you know, the target audience, but also the people who were interested in participating in this. How has it been for you? Yeah. So, like for me, honestly, I it was during the pandemic, and I just was really upset because I couldn't do any of the green teams I loved because we couldn't meet, and I just wanted some way to help the environment. And then I heard about this amazing opportunity, and I was just like a thousand percent in. And I knew it was like a pretty challenging internship to get accepted for. So, like, I really just 
worked on my application because I didn't want to not have this opportunity. It was just really great to help the environment with the pandemic still like stopping everyone else from doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I actually was uh, looking for an internship in general over the summer and then I got a notice through my school through our school, sorry. And um, I'm actually really glad I saw it because it was related to my interest and it wasn't just like something out of the blue because mm -hmm. um, we recycle and compost at home and then I just, I am really passionate about helping the environment and because it's our world we live in. So I want it to be healthy and not polluted or anything like that. And it's really nice trying to actually put my work in rather than stuff like randomly signing petitions. It's nice to see, um, my work going into something mm -hmm. yeah for me i really enjoy like research projects i did national history day throughout middle school where mm. i did a lot of like history-based research and this internship appealed to me because it was an opportunity to collaborate with groups in the town and learn about everyone's different interests and then sort of that apply that in a project that would not only represent the town but also like spearhead activism so yeah, we've been talking about the project, but let's describe what the project entails, right? Because as you said, Tom's vision is the, this idea of markers mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and kind of using that to project into the future and, uh, and then have those reminders all over town. And this right. is a New England right. town, right? So perfect to have these markers all over the place. But how, how did things, you know, actually, uh, how did you dis decide Hey, what's going to be on the markers, and how did that whole process work? You know, work itself out, especially because you said I think you were your, your idea was to give as much of the agency of this yeah. to the youngsters, so to speak. I I really want to compliment Rachel on that. I I mean I. Um, sadly don't get the opportunity to 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 work all that often with young people and when an adult works with a young person it's so attempting to push them around you know and <laughs> uh, and um, it's almost like we're programmed to take control and that is not what we needed to do here this is really trying to, to hand the leadership over um, to the to the interns and I want to say part of the reason that I was inspired to make this a youth-based project was how impressed I was with the student activism around the school strikes mm -hmm. and there were Arlington High School um, students who've since moved on to college who were leaders in some of the biggest school strike uh, protests in in Boston City Hall so that idealism that courage that knowledge that um, desire to, and it's an existential problem, climate change is the existential problem that young people face. So, um, you know, to, to, to give them a pathway to uh, mobilize people in their community to take action, mm -hmm. that's, that's part of what this project is about. So we, we brought sample markers, and we're all going to talk a little bit about our markers to make it concrete, but in terms of your question, uh, do you guys want to talk about process, how you worked in teams and... Yeah, um, and let, let me actually start with you, Rachel, about that, because as Cecily was saying, you know, this was your commitment to right. making sure that these guys were in charge as much as possible. What are the kinds of things that you did from the get-go to kind of ensure that? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think, I mean, one of my favorite parts of my job is, is working directly with the students, and I've known most of these students. Um, including the ones sitting here since elementary school and middle school um, because they were so actively involved in um, environmental activism. And um, so, you know, that's just been great to kind of continue that on into this project. And we are so lucky to live in Arlington where we have close to 20 organizations already in town that are um, actively involved in sustainability work. Um, and so I always think of my role as the connector, like connecting the students to the other um, organizations that are happening. And so, that was part of this. That's kind of what went into the markers, which I'll let them talk about more, but they were connected to a lot of these groups in Arlington um, and got to learn from them and do research and, and then kind of create these messages that mm -hmm. they wanted to share out with the community. And you guys, as you said, this was summer work initially, a summer internship, um, but it's turned into a year and a half. And I know that you haven't been at it the whole time. You have some other things on your plates as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, talk about how you were asked to take the leadership and how that worked for you. Yeah, so like to begin with, you're kind of like struggling because you are really like, you haven't really had this kind of 
opportunity before to really see how it feels to be a leader but then like after a couple of weeks of the internship I found myself like developing so many skills that like I use every day now and honestly because of that I felt like I was able to continue this project and it became not just about like completing an internship and like getting a gold star but to like help this environment and continue this project to its capacity to like inform other people about the dangers we're gonna see in the future for climate change. No, yeah, I really agree with Greta. Like, I think it really helped me develop some skills with like managing things. Um, I don't think I would have been able would have been able to like manage my schoolwork actually without a lot of the skills I developed through this because like we've been working on a lot of things like the markers and then we have a website and um, we've been working on different areas regarding those. But it's you really do need a lot of skills to manage those, and if you're not on top of it, it kind of it's a little bit stressful, but it's it's really helped with learning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as Rachel said before, we were working with a lot of different community groups. So like over the course of the internship, I met I met with maybe like four different groups in the community. And really, what I took away from being a leader was like how to manage like other adults in that setting, how to come up with questions that would engage everyone involved and help them understand what the project was and what they could contribute to it, and then what they could also get out of it. That's that's great. You know, it's interesting just in hearing a couple of answers from each one of you. I can I already have a sense of what it was that you brought as individuals to this whole thing as well as, you know, what is some of what you took from it, which is really cool. But here's here's another question and I have to say I didn't I didn't know I was going to ask this question and I didn't prepare anybody, so take your time if you if you need to. But I'm I'm wondering, I don't know what's on the markers, although I did go to the original ceremony when the temporary ones were put up. And I did read all of them at that time. So um, I don't know the specifics of what's on the markers and I know you guys will talk about it. I know very little of it is probably encouraging um, in a lot of ways, right? Because in, this is a grim situation in, in, that we're facing. How was that part, and here's my question, how was that part for you guys as young people who you know, spent some time in doom and gloom land here, I would think? Yeah, it's like, it's kind of finding that right balance because honestly I feel nowadays a lot of people focus on like the black and white aspects of life like that we're all going to die or climate change doesn't exist and I think part of this Mm -hmm. project like purpose was showing that honestly gray line between those and um, the markers show both the resiliency that people can help to stop these events and what could happen so I feel like balancing both the hope and the doom and gloom, as you said, it was like essential to this project to inform people that it's not all bad, but we still need to do something about it. Mm-hmm. No, I completely agree about the balance bit. I mean, I know, I mean, with climate change, there is a lot of tragedy and I want people to be aware of that tragedy, but I also want people to be aware that we have solutions and we have the ability to change things And I don't want people to be stuck in like a pit of gloom. I want people to know that we have power and we need to work on taking our abilities and like applying them to to the environment because we we have so much technology, we have so much ability, and I just we need we need support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, similar to what Greta and Juliet said, um, climate change is like obviously a very big issue, but these markers like the main goal is really to show people that they can be resilient and show them that there are solutions and that they can be applied if they take action. Also, there was one specific marker that actually validated like sort of the anxiety people feel about climate change and how it's a really real and pressing issue and we sort of need to accept that climate change will have consequences, not only like environmental consequences, but also on like mental health and that like in populations. Mm-hmm. And that, that marker was commemorated the opening of a support space for people to go to, to process their emotions, to grieve, to get support. Um, I think this, the, students, the students knew that there is now <laughs> a need for that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, that, that bespeaks the, uh, the deep thoughtfulness with which you guys made the decisions that you made for what is going, what is on these markers. So let's talk about them. Um, you all have markers in front of you. Start wherever you want, uh, or with whomever you want. 
I have a feeling Greta's gonna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this is my favorite marker I have in front of me. It's Minuteman Bikeway closes permanently due to dangerous flooding, and that's May 17th, 2039, which is not that far away in the future. So um, I chose this one because as an avid biker, I use this a lot for transportation, for getting somewhere, or just for recreation. And like the Minuteman Bikeway is such like an essential part of Arlington and the surrounding towns that to like take it away is just terrible. And it's a source of public transportation that can stop us from using cars and other like gas vehicles that just on the bike path, you're just helping the climate not like sink into despair. So the idea of taking it away with um, the more the increase in storms that continue to happen is just like that thought was t so terrible to me that like I felt like I needed to do something about it and let people know about this danger that could be very real very soon. Such a stark illustration. Excuse me, Cecily. I just have to jump in and say before we move on, that one. When when I saw it at, at the uh, Fox Library, at the fir the, the first uh, iteration of this, um, I went over to my wife and pulled her over because that's that's me. I'm on that bikeway all the time. That I love that place, and that just pulled me up short. You know, such a so anyway. So. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say that this one I think falls into the category of a wake up call. Mm -hmm. You know, which some of them are is like oh, a wake up call, and it's going to go right at the entrance of the Minuteman bikeway near uh, the kickstand this, cafe mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. at the Minuteman yeah. bikeway sign because that is part of the philosophy of this is that where people are standing that is where this impact could take place mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. that's that's great Look. Yeah. Um, so the marker I did was a uh, last gas-powered bu public bus retired bus service becomes 100% electric December 31st, 2040. So this is actually a real goal for the MBTA. Um, I did a bit of research on this recently and um, considering I use public transport so much, I'm actually really, 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 like I cannot speak into words how much I'm glad they're doing this because I mean, so many people use public transport every day and I want something that people use every day to be sustainable and better for the environment. And obviously, like with electric buses, they've been proven to be a lot better than diesel buses. And even though the goal is 2040 um, and that seems so far away, I'm glad they're doing it in the first place. I mean, you'll, you'll see companies that just aren't doing anything at all. And this is great to see. So. Wonderful. The one I chose was Native Plant Initiative transforms 50% of Arlington lawns, increasing biodiversity and oxygen production, 2043. And the reason I chose this marker to share is because I feel like my personal connection to it really exemplifies one of the goals of the project, which is to increase awareness. So before the project, I didn't really understand why native plants were important or why invasive plants were bad. I just knew those as facts, but I did a lot of research to write this marker paragraph and I learned a lot about how native plants like support biodiversity, which is critical to ecosystems and invasive plants like don't serve that function and therefore are like really detrimental. And researching this marker inspired me to read Nature's Best Hope, which is a really wonderful book, really informative. And I learned a lot and got involved in multiple like native plant um, initiatives in the town. Well, Rachel and Cecily, I. I'm glad you guys are the ones trying to follow up these these young people right <laughs> well, now. I just what? we don't have it here, but I just want to say a, a nice pairing with the Native Plant Initiative is the Knotweed Cafe, right? Yeah. So um, this was uh, the vision of a cafe where everything that was served up was made with invasive species. Mm. So knotweed can go into muffins. There are invasive crabs right now that are really wreaking havoc on shorelines, green crabs. People eat them in Venice. Why not here? Um, so we have a, a plaque for that as well. <laughs> That's so very cool. I'll, I'll give that as my example. Great. And Rachel, what have you got? Yes. So I am highlighting this marker um, that was... Um, 
created by a student, one of our student interns that's not here today, but it's Student Advocacy Brings Comprehensive Climate Crisis Curriculum to K through 12 Arlington Public Schools in the year. Comprehensive Climate Crisis Curriculum. Uh, that alone. That alone. Three times fast. Um, in the year 2026, which is very intentional that mm. it can happen soon, mm -hmm. because as you can see from these um, three student interns, their advocacy is pretty impressive and strong, and we can make this happen um, very soon. And this is near and dear to my heart because of the work that I do, um, working with green teams, with youth from you know K through 12, um, who are constantly trying to bring attention to the climate crisis and have told me that um, in school, it's just here and there that they get some of this education, but really not comprehensive or consistent um, through the grade levels. And it's something that's really needed and so important. So, And, I, and I would mention that this is an example of sort of how things evolved through group discussion. Mm -hmm. Because at first the idea was, well, let's have it at the high school level. And then why stop at high school? All right, let's think about middle school and fifth and sixth grade. And then sort of, well, yeah, let's see what, what could we, how could we put this throughout the system and start in kindergarten? Um, yeah, especially yeah. because I think either all three of you or certainly, you know, a number of you have been at this, right? Have been involved with green teams from when you were in elementary schools. Right. Yeah. So uh, again, showing the, the fruits of, uh, of building that kind of curriculum in from an early age, that's, that's a wonderful thing. But every marker represented discussion, debate, advocacy. Um, the 12 students broke into teams of three or four and um, growing out of their, you know, both internet research but also conversation with the uh, activist stewardship groups that Rachel was talking about. They came up with their, each team came up with, I think, about 10, maybe, ideas, maybe in some cases more, and then put them all up on one jam board because we did that all through mm -hmm. Zoom. Mm -hmm. Remember the horrifying jam boards? Those are over, right? <laughs> Thank I hope God. it's over. <laughs> so, and narrowed it down, and uh, we had other ideas that we, we, couldn't, we couldn't implement just because of the constraints of our time yeah. and mm -hmm. so we have 23 markers great I was gonna say out of you know I'm sure that the um, that the competitiveness of getting the marker all the way through the, the process was kind of similar to the competitiveness of getting these guys into the internship <laughs> and uh, you know something about it like I know you guys are all, all about collaboration rather than competition I have no doubt about that uh, but it is kind of cool just to realize that there was a rigorous process here um, in which really you tested ideas, you defended those ideas, you explained those ideas, you understood them better yourselves as a result, etc. This is, this is, that's the best part of learning and learning in, by doing group things in a lot of ways and for such a good reason here. So I do want to commend you guys very much for this project, um, but I also know that it, it has led to another project which we should also talk about in the time that we have left. So which of you would like to explain uh, the knock-on project? I guess I'll Everybody's go. eyes turn around there. <laughs> yeah, so I think that the mural project was the perfect like continuation of this project. It was with Sophie Tuttle and we managed to make this beautiful mural that uh, explains to residents basically the importance of native plants and how harmful invasive species can be. And like the idea of emphasizing native plants was really important to me. And I also really love art and being involved with art. So it was really awesome to combine both environment and art in the mural. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about, well, where is the mural that we're talking about? It's actually right by the high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess I'll talk about my experience. Mm -hmm. um, basically, um, yeah, we kind of chose slots to help Sophie Tuttle paint the mural itself. She would do all the fancy work. Um, and it was actually really great seeing all these um, animals and like insects come to life. Because, I mean, I learned things. Like, I, I saw a wasp and I was like, I didn't even know that was native. I, I, I just don't know all this information. It's great seeing it there. It's great seeing it right next to the high school, too. Because then I can see it and I go, oh, I worked on that. <laughs> so um, that's really fun to see. Um, and I'm also um, 
an amateur digital artist myself, so I really admired her work, and it's stunning, obviously. So it was it was very nice to do. Mm -hmm. Another thing we did is we wrote about all the native species featured on the mural on our website, climatefuturesarlington.org, so that people could not only see the native species, but also read and learn more about them. Yeah, we have to put QR codes up. Yeah. That's a remember. A Another thing we have to remember, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, it's like kind of endless, but in, in mentioning the website, yes. these three actually b were responsible for building this amazing website. And everyone watching this, please go to climatefuturesarlington.org and um, you'll see a little bit about the students, about their guest speakers, about all the community groups that they interacted with. And every marker has um, a couple of paragraphs written to amplify the story behind the pithy mm -hmm. uh, marker statement that's mm -hmm. all on the website and we're in process now of put kind of also posting this information on a regional website that Tom Starr has designed so let, let me um, wrap up this part of our, our conversation by asking the three of you um, you you are about to Juliet. You are a senior, and I know that the other two of you are juniors. Um, so you have been at this a long time. Um, and Juliet, you're about to go off to college, and good luck and have fun. Um, but how how do you see the work that you've done here fitting into a kind of line of like like what you can leave to others to carry on in terms of work to be done at the high school? Have, are you thinking about that much at all, or? Yeah, I mean, like, there's always the green teams and groups that just dissolve once everyone goes to college. But I feel like the really important thing is to leave a legacy that other people can continue to add to. And that's why, like, it's really important to, like, connect with the younger people in high school about this. And it's really great in high school because we have a lot of people doing that. Recently, the Arlington High School combined green teams so that we could still have separate but they could all connect so none of them would dissolve. And it's just important to keep those green teams involved, I think. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree with Greta. And one, also, one thing about the mural that is so close to the high school, I just hope it inspires other people. I mean, obviously they'll see the mural and go, wow, that's amazing, because I mean, how could you not? <laughs> but um, I hope they're curious about why on earth it was put there. And then I hope that it'll, it'll lead them to either our project or something else, and they'll be inspired to do sustainable stuff in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there will also be multiple markers near and around the high school, so hopefully people will see them when walking to school and just around the town. Mm -hmm. So these three wonderful interns will, um, you know, will be moving on to great other things in the next couple of years. You'll be here for a little while, we hope, <laughs> uh, Rachel. Um, what do you, how do you see things kind of developing from here or building on this? Yeah, well, I have a lot of optimism about this because since I work with a lot of the younger students, I, I see their interest, their passion for this, and I feel like they, these students are inspiring to them and role models, and I'm going to share about this project. I'll share the website. I'll share pictures. You know, we can do field trips to look at the markers. Um, mm -hmm. So I think um, there are a lot of younger students that will be inspired and will continue this work for years to come. All right. Well, I'll give you the last word here, but I just want to say thank you very much to all of you for being here. This was really fun for me and educational, which is the best combination. <laughs> so thanks. Any last words? Well, so to speak. I guess a personal thing I would say is your question is interesting you know how these interns see their legacy with arlington high school how this might be continued but what i am actually most excited about is to see how they go on now i want to know where they are in four years i want them to get in touch with me when they get into college i want to hear uh, how this affects their lives going forward because i really feel in, in, in varied ways. I mean, they're, they're going to follow paths that will, um, that will impact the way that we live in the future. And um, it's been an honor and pleasure working with them and getting to know them. So. Well, I can hear the emotion in your voice, <laughs> and I also share how inspiring it is for us adults to be able to work with young people a lot of the time, and you guys should always recognize that, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, with that, thank you all for being here. Um, I um, 
we'll just wrap up this segment. There will be uh, other conversations to come on this topic. Uh, we hope that you will join us for those as well, but we're glad that you were here. I thank our guests, all of them, once again, I'm not going to go through everybody's name once more, um, but uh, we really do appreciate their time and yours as well. This has been Talk of the Town in ACAC Update and Beyond, I would say. <laughs> um, and uh, we will, I'm James Malen. We will see you next time. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to this uh, kind of special edition of Talk of the Town with a focus on uh, Arlington's Commission for Arts and Culture uh, and uh, specifically the project, Climate Futures Project, uh, that we have been discussing with various participants in that project. And now, in an important uh, addition to that conversation, I am going to talk to Tom Starr. Tom is both the artist behind the project and a professor of design at Northeastern University. So uh, we had to catch Tom via Zoom, um, but we are very glad to have his company. Tom, thanks so much for joining us. I'm glad to be here. Really do appreciate it. Um, so uh, as I said, you are uh, the uh, creative mind uh, behind uh, this project and um, just very curious about um what the gestation of it is how did how did this come about because and i also know that that this is the arlington iteration of a project that is more regional or broader at least in concept and in implementation so just talk to us uh talk us through uh the creative process a little bit please yeah. okay i'm happy to um yeah so this is a larger project it's intended to be regional in nature um and I was, you know, compelled to try to grapple with uh, climate change and the way, you know, people don't seem to uh, grasp it or want to grapple with it uh, fully uh, and considering it's such a big issue. So, you know, being a university professor, I'm in a kind of interesting position where, you know, design can be applied to many different things. Um, and, you know, we are um, in a position to kind of create new uh, ways to use, utilize design. Um, and my area is graphic and information design. So communicating uh, through words and images uh, to make things convincing and clear. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought, well, you know, maybe there aren't enough um, design resources being put toward this issue of, of climate change. And so I wrote a proposal uh, that in, uh, basically um, explained that I would be trying to work with local scientists who are dealing with climate change um, issues on a local level, because we hear so much about it globally or nationally, um, and to see um, if I could help communicate uh, to uh, local communities, individuals, um, you know, what the ramifications of climate change might be, you know, uh, on a more personal level, you know, or closer to home. So, um, so in, in doing that, I, um, you know, I investigated, um, you know, what some of the issues are with the resistance to accepting climate change. And I think it's changed a bit in the last five years since I, um, you know, originally wrote the proposal, you know, in part because of being confronted by droughts and, you know, different phenomena that we, you know, fire a lot of fires and things like that. But, um, but um, nevertheless, there seem to be, um, the research seems to show that there are, there are psychological gaps present in, um, you know, in this concept of climate change um, that, or getting in the way of people embracing it. And so um, one of these was um, the concept of uh, actual spatial distance. In other words, if we see melting ice sheets in Greenland, you know, or something happening in Siberia or uh, the South Pole, you know, these things don't resonate with us in the same way as if it was something nearby. And so the basic concept was that um, I would try to create landmarks, signs of some 
sort that would be installed um, in the area in, in in various places in New England where it it could be uh, where it was projected by scientific studies that something um, would change in that place mm -hmm. due to climate change. So in some cases, it could be something that actually already happened, um, like the Mother's Day flood of a few years ago, which now people kind of realize had something to do with, you know, climate mm -hmm. change was behind that. Um, so it can be things like that, or the 2018, um, you know, winter storm where things flooded and along the coast in Boston. Um, but it also can be things that science is projecting to happen, you know, much more in the future. And, um, and that's where, you know, the concept really kind of got interesting because at first I thought, you know, I would be landmarking perhaps places where an unusual, unusually high, high tide had reached. Um, and, and I was inspired by this by um, markers that I've seen, uh, specifically there's a memorable one in Providence. Uh, I used to teach there and I came across it one day on the back of a downtown building along the river. And you know, it's about chest high and it marks the height of the water at the hurricane of 1938. I was like, wow, that is, <laughs> that's something. You know, if you read about it in, the, in a book or something, that's one thing, but to stand right there and see it was really something. And um, so I thought, well, that would be, that would be good. And as I looked into how to, you know, uh, implement this, uh, I found that there weren't that many situations where as dire as, you know, let's say tidal flooding might be um, coming with climate change, that it was it was hard to predict, you know, just how high these things would mm -hmm. be, I mean, or and it was more like how far the water would reach inland, rather than a particular height. And it, it became a little bit difficult to see how I would um, create a marker for that. If it would be in the ground, and people would have to look down at it. If it if it was on a pole, then people assume, well, that pole is the height of it. But no, that's not what I mean. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. the distance. So. You know, I went through a lot of um, thought process about how th this might happen, and um, and so the other psychological gap that I was grappling with was the concept of time. So that you know, um, a lot of climate change effects say, well, will there be you know uh, a two foot rise by twenty fifty at the sea level? And so, you know, 2050, you know, it sounds pretty far away. It's not really, we're already in 2022, <laughs> but, but still, it doesn't seem um, immediate. So, you know, at, at some point, I realized um, that I have to make that time distance more uh, compelling. Mm -hmm. And so, like with the marker for the hurricane of 1938 there I noticed um, around New England there are many um, tercentennial markers um, one right near where I live in fact that states very specifically that from this spot this very spot the um, wagon trains left for Ohio to you know to move settlements um, into the Midwest um, and I always find these things really interesting because they call to mind, you know, things you've read in history books that you never really thought too much about. And then you're suddenly you're in that spot. And so um, I thought, well, what if we could turn this around and, um, you know, and refer to these things that are going to be in the future as if we were looking at them from the 22nd century? And uh, and and that seemed to suddenly, you know, get a lot of people's attention when they see these uh, dates from another time. Yeah, I have to say it's a wonderful, actually, a description that you just gave, whether you realize it or not, of the 
many steps uh, of, of in the creative process. As you try and take what starts as an idea and you're a designer, you need to turn that into something palpable, something real and something compelling in this case. You really, you know, that's an important piece of this. Yeah. And for you to arrive through these kind of two steps forward, one step back or whatever, however you want to see mm -hmm. it, you know, just, just really needing, it, it, it didn't come to you whole by any means. Right. Uh, but instead, uh, you know, again, helping us see how you would get from that original conception to the point where you realize, ah, historical markers, you know, from a vantage point in the future that will tie us in in the specific ways you're talking about that will deal with the time element and also with the kind of like this this makes it much more palpable doesn't it uh when somebody right. is sitting at a bus stop or something looks up and sees uh this this historical marker about something that could happen in the future uh that is both plausible and 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 quite often uh you know, a, a daunting to say the least, yeah. or scary or dramatic, uh, et cetera. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, you know, that it does is it makes something that seems like it could happen to something that did happen. You know, obviously you, your mind has to make that leap, but in writing the language for these things and kind of, you know, trying to adopt the persona of the people who write the the tercentennial plaques that we see, you know, writing them in the past tense about the future, you know, does, it seems like a trick, but, you know, it really is dramatic. And, uh, and it makes it seem, you know, much more definite than, you know, a scientific projection is, you know, based on a lot of facts. It's not like really like even a forecast, you know, the, the weather is much more fickle Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I'm I'm sure projections can be off, but I think most climate change projections have been off in the wrong way, and that the right. effect is coming been, sooner. Right. So uh, you know, I feel like any errors are you know not going to be um, you know a problem. Right. Yes. And and so let's let's talk about the specifics of this iteration here in Arlington, which I don't know exactly what's going on in the other communities in, in which you are also pursuing this project. But I know that here uh, you have worked in collaboration with a number of high school students, um, as as well as, you know, the the public art infrastructure we have already here in, in Arlington, but high school climate activists uh, have been a big part of this project um, with you here in Arlington. And I was struck in talking to uh, the, some of the students who were involved. Um, you know, I really wondered how was it for young people to live in with this kind of like doom and gloom uh, aspect of mm -hmm. climate change that that's how it feels to us and we you know we we recognize more and more all the time what kind of a psychological a burden this is on our younger generations mm -hmm. who are uh you know really struggling uh with this recognizing that this is their world uh the the, the future uh and that things look so grim and their response to me i thought was really interesting and i wonder what you uh think about this and also as a way of asking you just how what it was like to work with high schoolers in this case I asked I posed the question to them you know was this depressing in a sense you know mm -hmm. to spend your time this way and they pointed out and then I looked at the markers and, and realized of course they were right that many of them uh, many of the markers themselves uh, are are citing something that would give one hope citing something about the resilience uh, with which we can collectively uh, meet this challenge. Um, and they, you know, they, they, you know, basically opened my eyes to the fact that, hey, we don't have to just assume that the worst is going to happen. We also can commemorate uh, from a future perspective, as you were just uh, saying, uh, we can commemorate the right steps that we can take. And mm -hmm. in so doing, again, foster hope, I would assume. But let me let me as a let me use that as an entree to ask you about what your experience has been like here. Yeah. Well, let me just say that the the first communities that I that I worked with, um, you know, I, I worked simply myself with 
uh, the planning boards or the uh, select boards, the town managers. And, um, you know, and that that was good. And it kind of shaped, you know, how the framework of, of the project. And, and in fact, that led to more, um, some more optimistic messages because what I found out was that the, um, you know, the response to climate change and the planning and of adaptations and uh, mitigating fossil fuels and things like that, you know, was really being taken seriously on the local level by almost every community, certainly every community that I work with. And that was, you know, very impressive. And so there was a good reason to, you know, have uh, those kind of uh, messages. So, you know, I had that as a background, but the, the big difference in Arlington is that instead of um, the messages being kind of, you know, conceptualized or uh, driven by myself or other grown-ups who uh, managed to get us where we are now, <laughs> um, that, you know, the students were able to um, take the lead and, you know, we helped them speak to, uh, you know, various uh, members of the community in uh, different um, different organizations and committees at the uh, town government level and um, and things like that to you know to get a, a real understanding of what was going on um, but the, you know they were able to um, come up with the the point of view and the topics that they wanted to cover that meant something to them um, and and that's what's been really great. And in fact, they came up with many more possibilities than I had come up with in any other community. And, and that, that's been really impressive. And, and I think, well, they, they didn't, I didn't discuss with them about whether it was depressing or not, this whole <laughs> topic, but they're, they're, we did get a tremendous response to the call for participation um, so there were many students who wanted to participate in, participate in this project. And I think, you know, I think the thing is, it's not the project that might have been depressing anyway. It's, <clears throat> it's the topic, right? Excuse me. Mm -hmm. So I think, <clears throat> I think this has been on their mind and now they're able to actually do something about it. <clears throat> that could ha have an effect. Yeah, they think that they echoed that same sentiment when I was speaking mm -hmm. with them. And clearly, um, you know, as a former high school teacher for many years myself, I know mm -hmm. that giving uh, young people, especially high schoolers, uh, teenagers, a sense that they <laughs> that we both respect what they have to say and think, um, but also that they have something to contribute, something that they that they can do as you yeah. were just saying, uh, really makes a, a huge difference and is an extremely powerful motivator. And clearly that was the case with these very impressive uh, Amer uh, Arlington High School students that were involved in the project. Yeah, yeah they are very impressive. And, you know, that um, goes beyond the uh, messages on the plaques them themselves, which are very terse. It doesn't mean they're simple. I mean, it's not easy to get the thoughts you want down to uh we have a character count of like 118 or something uh that fits on the plaque but then <clears throat> for all their research you know the um the plaques each have a qr code that connects to more information and they wrote these long essays um about the research they had found and all backed up with um additional uh links to their sources and i i found them very impressive yeah, it, it really is. Uh, it, it, it's a wonderful project in on a number of different uh, in a number of different aspects. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm honored in a sense to be able to speak to all of you who have been making it happen. Um, let me ask you uh, before letting you go, um, just to share a little bit i've just asked you about working with the young younger folks mm -hmm. but what what get especially because you're coming from a place in which you are as you said had you've been working with a number of different communities you've been you were initially impressed um and have been continued and have continued to be impressed by what the leadership in those communities is doing about this uh this issue etc um so how does arlington 
fit in uh, with that whole thing? What kind of, you know, how well are we doing? Um, uh, would you would you uh, estimate? And um, you know, in in this in in the same way. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like it's uh, in Arlington. It's being taken seriously and planning for the future. Um, just as in in the other communities I I dealt with. So um, it's hard to you know rank them, but I think right. yeah. they're basically equivalent. Um, that said, you know, there's some unique situations with each community, and that's why even though this um, this project right now is evolving out over about 15 different co communities, um, one in New Hampshire and uh, the majority along the, the, the North Shore, of Massachusetts and we'll probably be doing Cambridge in addition to Arlington. But, you know, Cambridge and Arlington both have uh, issues with the river and the, um, mm -hmm. uh, the Amelia Earhart, Earhart Dam. I mean, there are unique situations um, that come to bear on each community um, by the same external forces, you know. And, uh, you know, here in Arlington, I think one of the things we take great pride in um, as we consider ourselves as a community is the, it has been embodied in this project in some way, which is our commitment to activism, community activism, mm -hmm. um, and the sense that we need to take responsibility for our, our community and our actions. Um, and then secondly, is this celebration, a con constant celebration of public art, um, in yeah. our space here in Arlington. And because this project has combined those two things so compellingly, uh, I just wanted to ask you for your thoughts about that. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that that's another unique situation here that, um, you know, I haven't had in other communities where the, um, the you know, the Arlington Commission of Arts and Culture um, you know, working with Cecily to kind of spearhead this and somebody who knows the public art landscape within the town, you know, it's, that's a really uh, big help and knows who you have to speak to to get permissions and things like that. Um, and then, but that in combination with, um, you know, uh, Rachel, who manages the green team at the high school, you know, was really, uh, you know, a perfect combination uh, to bring both the uh, art and students together. Um, and so it was a tremendous amount of work. In other words, I, you know, they had to do a lot of this to uh, create the program for the students. And, you know, I, I obviously participated in those things, but without that framework, you know, the it, it wouldn't have worked if it was just, you know, myself and a few students. <laughs> it wouldn't have been the same, the same thing. And I would have um uh, I probably wouldn't have covered the same ground that that they did um and um you know I think that's that's made it a really great community project absolutely and speaking of which uh, let's close by by noting that I'm talking to you in mid the middle of November and the markers that are the basically the the representation of this project here in town have begun to go up I understand that's right. In fact, uh, just this morning, we're working with uh, 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 people from DPW to put them up, and that's been really great that we've had a cooperation from, uh, you know, the people who, you know, lead DPW to, you know, kind of give us the framework in which they would, or the structure they would like to, uh, to see as we put them up, you know, not just in any old place, and that they wanted to... Um, to help us in, install them in certain places where they go on, you know, municipal light fixtures or things like that. And so we worked with two gentlemen this morning um, who are just terrific and uh, helping us get them up all at their correct height and facing the right way and securely fastened. And, uh, you know, and they had, they had busy days. I'm sure this was, you know, a completely extra thing for them to do, so. Yep, well, let me, let me, uh... Just close by noting this: um, we're talking about you know climate change is the issue here, as we've been discussing, and I know we are just coming out again of a 
period of about a week or week and a half here in early November, which felt a lot more like August to most of us, right? right. And I know very few people who uh, could simply just in an unambiguous way or unambivalent way, enjoy that without thinking, hmm, there's something a little bit wrong about all right. of this. Mm -hmm. I imagine you shared that sentiment. But uh, by the same token you were discussing before we went on air, that oftentimes as you are making your uh, projects happen out in the, uh, in the spaces in which you do, that's happening in the spring and summer and nice weather, et cetera. So the fact that we are have just recently, uh, November has kicked in in earnest in these last few days and looks like it will remain with us for the rest of this month and on. Mm. Uh, you know, I just want to commiserate with you for the fact that we are returning to normal as you are continuing to get these uh, markers up. Um, I know that by, uh, you know, by December, early December, mid-December, something like that, most or all of the 23 markers will be up around town. Um, and uh, I wish you very good luck for your own part in uh, in doing the work to do that, because you will be dealing with November weather, I think. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we're happy to do it. So. All right. I, th I thank you so much for your time. Any last thoughts, Tom? Anything that you wanted to say, and we didn't have a, give you a chance um, to? Well, no. Just thank you for uh, you know devoting the program to this project, because uh, you know it's really terrific to get the word out for people to understand if they see these things, what's behind it, and uh, uh, you know, it just helps uh, helps the whole effort really. So. Well, I would imagine you you take at least a small, if and if not more than that, measure of pride in knowing that this idea in your head is turning into these kinds of forms in the different communities that you're working with. So I do congratulate and thank you for that, because I do think our communities will be richer for it. Well, thank you very much for saying that. I appreciate it. You bet. I have been speaking to Tom Starr. Tom is, as I mentioned, the artist behind the Climate Futures Project here in town. Uh, you will be seeing uh, all around town uh, the markers that we've been referring to. Um, and he is also a professor of design at Northeastern. So, um, Tom, best of luck uh, with everything, with this project and others in the future. Thanks so much for taking your time here today. Thank you, James. All right. And that will wrap this section of uh, this special episode of Talk of the Town up. Again, I'm James Milan. I've been speaking to Tom Starr. Appreciate his time and yours as well for joining us. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm James Milan, and I am, we are having this special Talk of the Town episode that's devoted to a couple of the projects uh, that our Arlington Commission for Arts and Culture, ACAC, uh, is involved in, and uh, that, as with most things that they're involved in, really good for the community. So I want to talk about it some more with Cecily Miller, one of the prime engines, as we know, of the ACAC. Um, and we are also joined uh, by Beth Locke, a familiar face to many of you from our Chamber of Commerce. I have to say, maybe viewers would be saying, hmm, Beth, I know her, Chamber of Commerce, yes. And Cecily, the, okay, you are at ACAC, you are the kind of kings of collaboration, or kings, queens, you know, you are, you are- <laughs> Leaders of the collaboration. The leaders of collaboration, uh. right? <laughs> um, and just kind of making those connections and making things happen. Explain this one for us. Please. Yeah, well, so we just talked a lot about a year and a half long collaboration that's wrapping up. Mm -hmm. This is a collaboration that we're getting ready to launch. Um, and it's, uh, it's to bring more murals to Arlington. We just talked about the great success of the native plant and pollinator mural. And building on that success, we applied for a grant. We, in this case, being the Arlington Commission for Arts and Culture, the Arlington Chamber of Commerce, and the Arlington Center for the Arts. Mm -hmm. um, we applied for a transformative growth grant from the town and received funding to first have a kind of a town-wide community planning effort and then to implement one to three murals. And I should say that um, Beth was instrumental in our pulling off the native plant and pollinator mural because our initial um, site Although the store owner was thrilled at the idea of a mural, the building owner in the end said no. Mm. So, 
Yeah, and that, that and you stepped, stepped in, in, I imagine, right? Stepped in, um, and I was happy to do so. And um, I had a couple of ideas of possible sites, and made a couple of calls and made some connections for Cecily. And one of them turned out being successful, and the mural is where it is today. And I think that's it's a fabulous location. Um, it really is central to town. The fact that it's so close to the high school where the kids, you know, the, the kids are every day and they see it. And it was fun to see one of them mentioning she enjoys, you know, seeing it every day as she um, goes to school. So um, that was that was a great process. And, you know, the chamber has the same um, mission to to collaborate and connect with as many mm -hmm. different types of, of organizations. We don't just work with businesses, we represent businesses, but we work with all types of organizations. So um, I also sit as a commissioner on the Arlington mm -hmm. Commission for Arts and Culture. And so I, I hear a lot about, you know, everything that's going on there. And um, I think that, I mean, I know there's great benefit to the business community um, with, mm -hmm. the, with the activities of that group. Yeah, and this is an example of a project um, that can contribute to the economic vitality of the town. Yeah, um, ex explain what you're doing. Well, oh, there's no that. question about that. I mean, um, you know, the uh, beautification, for lack of another word, is a, is a real um, uh, subject of interest to us in terms of trying to attract new businesses to town. Um, it makes, it, it could be art, can be plantings, can be, um, you know, the maintenance of storefronts, anything that makes um, the town look more alive mm -hmm. and interesting is good for attracting new businesses to town and helping the businesses that are here. We don't just want to attract new businesses. We want to have super successful businesses, you know, who are already established here. So um, I, I, uh, it's the perfect connection as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, it really there, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a vision, I imagine, in which these murals and having them, you know, increasing in increasing numbers around town can be in themselves an, an attraction for people to want to come, for people to tell stories, wondering what is going on in this one, mm -hmm. educating themselves around, uh, you know, large issues like the climate or specific things more specific to Arlington, et cetera, all of it kind of piques interest within the community, but also for those who might want to visit, I would think. Yeah, I agree, I agree, absolutely. We have um, a lot of things in this town that attract visitors. I mean, this sounds like another really fruitful co collaboration and people may be interested in knowing how they can you know, help this, these things happen. Or do you yeah. guys have yeah, we suggestions? Have, we have um, two ways that we're inviting the community to contribute to making this a success. One is a real quick survey um, where we're asking people to tell us what kind of themes they're interested in, to nominate walls, uh, maybe mm. in their neighborhood or near where they work or something they walk by or bike by on the bikeway, um, be our eyes, you know, identify places that would be exciting to have a mural. So uh, there's a link to that um, quick survey and it really won't take long on Arts Arlington. Um, you can get to it from the main page or from a drop-down menu of um, our signature programs. And then the second is we're inviting people to participate in a community advisory uh, committee. And um, it's not a heavy time commitment. It's essentially participating in three in-person meetings where we will talk about how do we decide on a site like if we can only do one to three murals, our, our funding in this round is limited. Mm -hmm. um, how do we choose? You know, should we go for the biggest wall we can find? Should we distribute small murals throughout a neighborhood and you can walk from one to another? Mm -hmm. um, so should they be in the cultural district? Should they be in a part of town where there's no arts and culture right now? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's one kind of bundle of questions and we want to hear what people think. Um, secondly, uh, artist selection process. Do we want to focus on local artists, Boston artists, New England artists? Could we have someone internationally? Would that be exciting for people in Arlington to mm -hmm. have an artist visit from another country to paint a mural? 
Um, and the third is what are some models of community engagement? We actually wrote into our grant stipends for young people. We want to have, um, just as you heard about the Climate Futures mural, the students were invaluable assistants to so Sophie Tuttle, who mm -hmm. did the design. So we would love to once again have youth mm. apprentices, but maybe there's a mural that a whole neighborhood comes to a, a painting day, mm -hmm. you know, and um, all ages, families, whatever. I mean, the the project that we've worked on in Arlington Heights where families paint storefront windows mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. has been super popular. Tremendous, and, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and do you, I mean, let me just ask you this last, last question, Beth. Do you, how do you see, you know, uh, Arlington businesses responding to this initiative, for instance, because likely or possibly a store owner is going to be who either desperately wants such a mural around them or, you know, how do you see that playing out? With I think there's a lot of interest mm -hmm. um, just just in initial conversations. I think some of some of the key locations around town that might might be obvious, um, you know, we've talked to property owners and there's interest mm -hmm. um, and also from business owners, you know, there's, you have to engage both the business owner and the property owner. The business owner may not be the, the property right. owner, they may be leasing. So um, there are a couple of different parties that have to be involved. But I think um, now that there are a couple of significant murals, the interest is going to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to say that uh, both the sites that I've been involved with, and that would be ZA in East Arlington. Um, uh, we did a mural there as part of mm. actually the BRT, the Bus Rapid Transit um, Initiative to improve bus service, and this pollinator mural. In both cases, the building owners, Michelle Casey, um, who was who we worked with on the pollinator mural, and um, the owners of ZA mm -hmm. uh, for the earlier mural, which was by James Weinberg, both were really supportive to the artists having a lot of freedom. Um, which was great. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, definitely um, there was dialogue, but there was a, a lot of trust between the building owner and these very accomplished artists who did these murals. So I um, hope that we'll, you know, we'll be able to build on that um, track record and um, give artists um, a lot of freedom, but at the same time, there may we may want to have more community input as to themes and um, mm -hmm. how how what ideas are expressed in a mural. Um, yeah, I love the fact that you brought up the word trust there because that seems to be really at the core of you know the collaboration you guys are talking about right here, um, the p potential uh, store owners, property owners, etc., who could be involved with this, etc., and the community at large, who you're from, whom you're seeking this input. I mean, there is that sense that w we can trust each other to do these things uh, collaboratively, in good spirit, and responsibly, yeah. um, and truly you trying come to come up take with a product that everyone is happy with. Yeah, yeah. That that when they want to get their photo taken next to. Yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> Fair enough. Reserve your spot now. Okay. Um, I want to thank Beth Locke for joining us and of course Cecily Miller who has been here throughout. Um, this is a special episode of Talk of the Town. Uh, again, focusing on the uh, Arlington Commission for Arts and Culture's collaborations and projects with different uh, parts of the community. Um, thanks so much to you as well for joining us. I'm James Millett. We will see you next time.